you guys get trainings all the time and trainings are really weak levers for change. If you want to change what's going on, change the, the incentive structure you have for your officers. And they started doing that and it turns out fewer black folks getting beat up, fewer folks in general getting beat up, fewer black folks in particular, fewer arrests. And I was like, hey, fewer of these things would be good. Maybe we can do this again. And that's how we started. It is my pleasure and privilege to welcome to Yang Speaks, the co-founder and CEO of the Center for Policing Equity, Yale professor, TED Talker, and now the president of Justice RX, Philip Atiba Goff. Welcome, Philip. Hey, thanks for having me. Philip, uh, I'm so pumped to have you because you are the smartest person I've ever met or heard of when it comes to uh, trying to actually solve for racism, particularly in the in environment of policing. So who the heck are you and how the heck did you come to this work? <laughs> I am a man who collects apparently lots of titles um, to be read on podcasts. Um, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a social scientist. I'm a nerd. Um, my The hashtag for the Center for Policing Equity is the Justice Nerds. Yes, we've had that trademarked. Um, uh, get the hoodies, get the t-shirts. Um, and what that means is that I like to figure out how to solve hard problems. Um, some people like to run marathons. I don't understand that. Um, uh, some people like to eat weird foods. Also don't understand that. I like that. I get the folks who like to solve problems. Right? Like, so, okay, so you're weird that way. You I want two for three, like weird foods and solving problems. I'm also with you in the non-marathoning. <laughs> <laughs> So I just, I like solving uh, problems that are difficult. Um, and I started doing that as someone who was an academic. My job was to ask questions and find up, uh, come up with answers that people hadn't had uh, previously. And then I got tired of people just writing that in journals for other five other people to read. I was like, these things I think work in the world, let's see. Because a doctor that's got an idea about how your heart works but can't actually fix your heart is a crappy doctor, right? I'm a PhD in social science. I should be able to figure out how it's working in the world. And it turns out, at the end of the day, a lot of the most powerful things to actually change the world are the stories that we tell about who we are. And so that's why I'm telling stories. And that's how I showed up here. Well, your story is incredible. So I, I don't know this. What the heck was your thesis on? You're talking about my dissertation? Yeah, I'm just so, so imagining you on your ascent. It's like, uh, you know, you're a PhD candidate, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. I don't know that the, the process of the PhD could be called an ascent. Um, uh, it's more like a floundering bird with cut wings. But um, the thing that I was really interested in when I got to grad school was ideology. Right? I, was, I was interested in why people thought the way they did and how that shaped, shaped things. And it turns out that none of the studies I did on that worked even a little bit. Um, and so my very wise, very gentle uh, PhD advisor, Claude Steele, was like, hey, that's going to be super successful, but let's start a second track of research. And in there, he tried. He he challenged me to think about identity as the most powerful um, uh, lever for for affecting change. And so there, what we were looking at was whether or not prejudice was going to be a big factor in 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 uh, causing discrimination, or if threats to white identity were going to be a bigger factor. And it was threats to white identity a thousand times out of a thousand. It was a super repl replicable finding, where when white people were worried about being seen as racist. They physically distanced themselves from the people who they thought were going to call them racist. And that physical distancing was a kind of discrimination that leads to all kinds of interpersonal things. Like if someone's pushing themselves away from you, like, do I, do I smell? Like, do you not like me? What's going on? And so we knew that there were collateral bad consequences from that. But most of the literature was saying, oh, it was prejudice that was predicting that. No, it was an identity process. And that was the dissertation that became one of the first uh, major publications I had. Oh, uh, what the heck year was that? <laughs> <laughs> I think they finally gave me credit for it in like 2005. Um, I finished it up in like 2003 and then there's that gap period where I was off trying to get a job. But 2005 is when they finally gave me the degree. Okay, so 16 years ago, <laughs> you wrote a dissertation <laughs> and it says that identity threat is uh, is the thing that, uh, that sets people off. Uh, really fundamentally and that if they're afraid you're going to call them racist or you do call them racist, then they physically recoil, which I would say is something that most people now understand <laughs> to, 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 to be true. going to skip that PhD dissertation, just hit the fast forward button. Uh, 
Uh, so one of the things that I am trying to come up with, uh, this might amuse you, is that right now we throw the word racist around uh, a little bit too liberally in my mind, or what, li excessively, I should say, not liberally, but like just, just someone will screw up and be like, that's racist. And it's like that there's like no term for it that's somehow less freighted. And so I, I was joking to my, my lovely wife who has to put up with me, um, like we need an expression that's like, that's something like, like this is what I came up with. It, it's dumb, but whatever. You'll like it because it's dumb. Um, like that was an excessive expression of tribalism or something where it's like, instead of saying that's racist, you, 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 you just say like, that was an excessive expression of tribalism. Um, Jordan doesn't eat <laughs> or, or, or just something that makes it seem really <laughs> clinical and that it's not like, like you're a capital R racist. Cause as soon as you call someone a capital R racist, they, you know, they shut down. What do you think, doctor? <laughs> yeah, so that's a fascinating project, um, or outcome, I should say. Um, and it's actually, you're right, everybody kind of gets, well, if you call somebody a racist, then they're going to do um, some, some banana stuff. But there's actually, to me, there's still insights going back to the dissertation that are lessons I wish we would learn. Um, because quite right, people get upset at the word, but when you don't use the word, it turns out they don't care at all. <laughs> They're not motivated to change a damn thing. And so the, the, the deal, the, the secret of that is for many folks, the only thing that matters is, do you think I'm a good person or do you not think I'm a good person? If I'm a good person, cool. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to fix any of the structural problems. We don't have to actually, you know, the outcomes are perfectly fine. If you think I'm a bad person, well then screw you. You're the worst person and you're the real racist. And that actually leaves us with no levers for making the change, for actually improving the conditions. So I don't think you're entirely wrong. That, right, that we there need has to, to be a middle ground language. that people will care about. It, but not that anyone would care about excessive expression of tribalism, because, you know, just go off their back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there, there, it is su it's a suboptimal solution that you've come up with, yeah. But I do think we should talk about, a, a little bit more specifically, at what level is the problem happening, right? So if someone says something and it's offensive, that's an interpersonal kind of thing. Right, and so I don't need you to be a bigot. I, you, you could just not have learned that that's not a thing that we say anymore. I don't like how you talk to me like that. Be like, hey, I don't like how you say that. Why? Well, because it hurts me. I don't like it for me, but also it's tied to these other things that are associated with deep level racism. And so you didn't do anything that's, that, like you didn't genocide anybody and I don't need you to react like that's what, that I'm talking about your character, but when you do it and then another person and then another person and another person, it adds up to doing this stuff that's really bad at an institutional and at a structural level. And so if you guide people back up and say, hey, compared to the things that this is associated with, this is nothing. But also don't do it because it's associated with these other things that are not nothing. That's a language that's it's a, it's more nuanced, but it's, it's the kind of thing I want people to be able to get into. Well, th this to me is a complaint that I have, Philip, is that um, the structures being completely demented and racist is the problem in my mind like you know it goes back generations and the rest of it um but we've just become fixated on controlling modes of expression it's like like if you say this then that's the problem it's like let's like try and solve the the big problem which i think they're you know obviously like like legitimate massive uh debts owed to people and you know like uh inequities that are, are baked in um and I, I want to try and uproot those. I mean, when I ran for president on universal basic income, I was like, let's just freaking give people money. Like, this is one way we could like, <laughs> like start making things like be better, more equal. Um, and uh, anyway, so so that that and in my mind, and this is something you and I may disagree on. And I, I obviously would love it if people um, avoided expressions that other people find uh, offensive, problematic, hurtful, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I, I feel like for whatever reason, like we're almost being duped, like we're being duped into paying attention to whether someone, uh, like says the right things while the structures just keep on grinding on, um, in terrible, terrible ways. Yeah. That's a, that's a framing that I, I hear a lot and it makes sense from one perspective because if it's a bunch of well-to-do folks in Brooklyn telling me how I should talk about sexual identity, Right, or how I should talk about race even more so. I'm like, mm, yeah, I'm not really sure that that's the thing I want to be spending my time on. Um, but I don't think it has to be either or. 
So part of the reason why I think we're seeing so much policing of language is because the folks who haven't been in charge of that are getting platforms to demand that there's different language. Like there was different language when powerful people needed it around um, uh, how we think about anti-choice movements, right? That became- The Republicans are experts at terminology. They're just so much better at naming shit. It's, it's wild. It's like, we're just gonna and, rename and, the estate tax the death tax and everyone will hate it. <laughs> we're, 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 we're gonna we're gonna call union busting rules right to work laws. Every, you know, every, you know <laughs> it's like up is down, black is white. Everything is, is is inverse. And so the deal is, the folks who had a lot of money spent a lot of money saying, "You don't say this, you say this other thing." I'm even hearing people on the political left side talk, talk about the Democrat Party instead of calling it the Democratic Party, which does some work. Okay. Um, I don't have a problem with an increased awareness of, hey, language has consequences and the people who are affected are asking for you to use different language, right? It, it can be annoying on a given day. It can be frustrating. It takes a lot of energy. I don't have a problem. I do have a problem if we do end up getting distracted. And I don't agree that the tussle over language right now has to be a distraction. It definitely is sometimes but it doesn't have to be. I'd rather us talk about the structures and if we're gonna uh, orient the language, make sure we orient the language towards the structures too. But when I'm asking for, for someone when, in my organization, when I, when I say, hey, we give pronouns here, those are structural issues, not just language issues. And I make sure that the way we describe it is to say this little thing that you can do with your behaviors is tied to these larger structural things. Doesn't have to be either or. And when we make it as if it's either or, we create kind of divisions within people who largely agree anyways. So yes. I, I, I like that, to stay away that, from that. that that's guy, part of right? it for me too, is like, if you're going to listen to me, like you're not the person I need to worry about. <laughs> like, I need to worry about the person who's like, you know, nowhere near this podcast. Um, so, so, to re so to return to your ascent, so you write this dissertation, uh, you become uh, uh, an academic, and then you become frustrated. You're like, hey, I'm coming up with all these great ideas. Look at my great ideas. Like, let's try them out in real life, which is a very rare thing for an academic to do. Um, so how the heck did you operationalize? You know, like, you, and, and what were the ideas you were trying to bring into the world? Yeah, so it happened on a dare. I mean, literally, there was a, a black woman who impugned my manhood. I don't I don't, I don't ask if I can curse on this podcast. Fuck um, yeah. All right, well, so she she said, one of the first things out of her mouth, I think it's literally the first, said, I don't think you have the balls to do anything real with your life. What? Who the heck would say that like, to that, a person? You could have said hello first. <laughs> my name is, uh, but that's not how she, she rolls. And so we were instant sibling, because I was like, oh, thanks for dispelling my uh, stereotype that all cops are assholes. Um, and uh, she was like, look, the folks who do a a academic stuff, they write in your fancy journals, um, they make you know decent living, living, they're not accountable to anybody. You wanna write about racism in the criminal justice system? Fucking deal with racism in the criminal justice system. And she invited me, I put that in quotes, um, out to Denver to see if there was anything useful I could possibly do. And after spending significant time out there, I was like, and I wasn't sure for a while, I wanna be really clear, um, after spending significant time out there, I was like, look, you guys get trainings all the time and trainings are really weak levers for change. If you want to change what's going on, change the, the incentive structure you have for your officers. And uh, once you've done that, you'll have some, some information you can use to say the way that policing is getting used in the first place is jacked up. It was racist from the start. But as a, as a police department, you're going to have a hard time doing that up front. So first, change the incentive structure you give to the officers. And they started doing that. And it turns out fewer black folks getting beat up, fewer folks in general getting beat up. Fewer black folks in particular, fewer arrests. And I was like, hey, fewer of these things would be good. Maybe we can do this again. And that's how we started. What were the, in first, what year was this? And then what were the incentives and what did you try and shift them to? So the first year that she talked about my absence of balls was 2007. Um, and then we went to to back to Denver pretty much that, that year. And I spent like a month and a half living with her um, and her husband. Um, like doing that commute and all the rest. And then by the time that we were done beginning of 2008, we thought we had a thing that was going to be useful for more than one department. And it was, don't go where there's low level problems, go where there's big problems. It's a huge controversial thing in 2008, right? Um, but don't go to the places where people are making complaints about someone being suspicious. Go to the places where someone is doing great harm. And when you do that, You'll reduce the burden on black folks. 
You'll reduce the footprint of law enforcement in these communities that are already uh, overwrought. And you'll increase the, the amount that you're intervening on the things that those communities actually care about, which is the body count. That was the big stuff. So that, that sounds eminently reasonable. Uh, they took your recommendations, which is awesome, and then they found that the results were positive, and then you said, we gotta do this again. Like, we did it in Denver, we're gonna, and so at what point did you actually uh, co-found the center? And how does one co-found a center at, at a school? So uh, it was in 2008, not by October, end of that year, they were like, we need some pamphlets and to call this something. Um, we were very bad at naming things. So we called it the Consortium for Police Leadership in Equity. You should have called a Republican. You... <laughs> I've been yeah. like, yeah, what do I name this thing? <laughs> so yeah, consortium as your lead word is already a loser. Um, uh, so we eventually uh, renamed it Center for Policing Equity. But the idea was, hey, police have a lot of power in these situations. And there's some who in good faith are trying to do better. Um, uh, how do we mainline to them the things that, that communities have been trying to say, but they haven't been listening to? And that's how we got started um, in 2008. And the way you, you do it is you say, you call yourself a center and you make sure that I was, I just moved to UCLA. I was like, hey, do you guys mind? And they're like, no. And so now we're a center. We didn't have a, a C3 until a couple of years ago because um, uh, we were just at the university and we use the university as a, as a fiscal sponsor. So fun. You were just a center. So any academic listening to this, if you want to start a center, just got to clear it by the dean who at this point will probably say yes to anything. So, uh, so 2008, you start the center um, at, in, in UCLA, and then what? Like, did police departments come knocking down your door? <laughs> I'm not sure if they did. Maybe they did. So, so this is the thing. This is, everybody's assuming that we had to go, like, Johnny Appleseed, hat in hand, and be like, please, uh, let us make you less racist. It was totally, like, I'm from Philly. Um, and I had my, my hypothesis walking into this as a scientist where the bigots are going to bigot policing attracts a lot of bigots and their bigotry is what I see in the streets and what I felt in my, in growing up, um, as a, as a black guy, um, from Philly in the suburbs. And it turns out that while that may also be true, cops showed up in drugs. There were 15 on 2008 who were like, yo, how do we be down? They're like, like, we really, we genuinely want to make this better. You're not going to call us names at the beginning, at the very least. And we're happy to make significant structural change institutionally, like inside of, of, of our, Incredible. our apartment. As, and, and it was shocking to me. I was like, I didn't offer them cookies. We like, we bought a couple of them a chicken lunch and that was it. Because And, and I was going to say, every single one, the very intake, we're going to find racism, systemic racism for which you are responsible. So when you sign up for this, we're going to find racism. And they're like, okay, that's scary. Or I don't agree with you. You're not going to find any racism here. Whatever it was, we told them up front. And when we gave it back to them, they did some of the things that we told them to do. And what were those things typically in addition to go where the problems are most serious and avoid the areas where it's people like crying wolf? <laughs> it sounds like... Yeah, and so so that was, it was a lot of that. Um, uh, it was also, hey... These are problems you shouldn't be dealing with. And the, and the thing that I think is, is ironic about the moment we're in right now, um, where you have a lot of organizers and activists calling for shrinking the footprint of law enforcement or for a full-on abolition, is that a lot of their demands were, were, I was hearing in my ears in 2008 from police chiefs. We shouldn't be in mental health. We shouldn't be in child welfare. We shouldn't be in homelessness. We shouldn't be in substance abuse. Um, and we would say, you're right, get out of it. Give some of your budget over. This was way back before abolition was was popular in the way that it is now. Give some of your budget over to doing some other stuff. Ask the city for these sets of resources so you have partnerships that are not you. You should be doing less. Deal with violence and nothing else. So those sorts of things. And then interventions that would remind them that most of their contact was not with people who were trying to shoot them. But just like a training here, a policy there that would do that. Those were the first big things that came out. And the next, the next round was a way for them to give themselves and for the community to get feedback loops on it. So literally, let's measure how out of whack you are in terms of your behaviors to what your values say you should be. And now you've got a feedback loop, not just for measuring crime, which is what they all did, but for measuring something like 
equity in your behaviors. And that was also a driver of better behavior. So like arrests go down, use of force goes down, officer injuries go down when you start measuring that stuff and keeping track of it. That's one reason I love you so much, Philip, and your work is that you change the measurements. Uh, if all you're doing is measuring uh, crime and people uh, in prison cells and the rest of it, then you're missing 90% of the picture, which is like, what are these other interactions? Uh, you know, what, what, what else is happening on, uh, happening on a daily basis that's good or bad? Uh, so you bring in different measurements uh, to different communities. And we're talking about way back in like 2008, 2009, um, so how the heck did you get the resource to do this? Like if, if these police departments are showing up and you're just a grad student hanging out in LA, like how the, how the heck do you somehow multiply uh, the impact in all these cities that aren't Denver? Yeah, so by that time I was, a, so by the time I was going to Denver, I was in a faculty job. And by the time I, I got to UCLA, I was like a, a known faculty person among social psychologists and known by like 12 people. Um, but the deal was police departments wanted to pay us and that seemed like a bad idea to me because if I'm getting money from the police department, how could a community that doesn't trust the police trust what I had to say? So we refused money from the place where we could get money from. The other place was that we, we, got, we heard from community activists who were like, yo, we need this. Um, and so we'll, we'll take up a collection. I was like, how am I going to tax black people in these vulnerable communities more than they're already getting taxed? So no thank you. So we couldn't take money from the communities that were under duress. And I didn't feel like we could take money from law enforcement. So I wrote a lot of grant applications. Like we got money from the National Science Foundation. Um, we got money from uh, Ford Foundation. Uh, we got money from MacArthur Foundation, from Kellogg, um, from uh, William T. Grant. I got money as a scholar to do that. I just, I was couch cushions and hat in hand from places where they wouldn't put a thumb on the scale of the work that we were doing in the community. What a champ you are, man. I want to hit fast forward just for fun. Like, what the heck is the center's budget today? Because I feel like people must be throwing money at you now. I don't know if that's right. <laughs> so I, I think it's really important to get the, the context of the last year. So in 2017, there's $220 million of philanthropic money going to criminal justice stuff broadly. 220 million. And that's more than had ever been in the nation's history. 220 million. By the way, 115 billion going to policing alone in terms of municipal and state budgets, but 220 million. 200 million of that is for decarceration efforts, 10 million to reentry, and 10 million dollars to policing. That means we were funding the issue of policing to the issue of incarceration as a 20 to 1 issue. You show me any community in the world where the pain of policing to the pain of incarceration is a 20 to 1 issue, but that's how we were funding it. So our budget is tiny compared to the money that we give out to, the money that is, is in the budgets to do decarceration efforts. That's bail, pretrial, progressive prosecutors, um, restorative justice work, um, deferment pro projects, tiny, tiny, tiny. It's still about 2.5% was going to policing before last year. Last year, about a third of the money towards um, uh, 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 criminal justice was going towards policing. And it was mostly going to organizations that were 15 people in one city, 20 people over there, a network of organizations um, trying to figure out what they were doing uh, all over the place. So now we think that the budget around policing is in the 200 to $300 million uh, range nationally, right? <clears throat> so that's what we're talking about. Still tiny compared to the problem. Yes. But that's as of just last year. Uh, yeah, obviously because of uh, the national moment um, and, and George Floyd's murder. Um, so you are one of the um, behemoths in that space. <laughs> I mean, not, not to say, I mean, whatever. It's like, a, it's a, you know, you're my favorite one, the, uh, you know, in terms of the, because you've been doing the work since 2008 and, um, and had these impacts. So you've had this, you had this grant writing spree uh, in 2010. You're doing this on top of your faculty job. Uh, now, I discovered you, and this says something about me, but whatever, um, uh, when you're a TED Talk in uh, 2019. So what was that experience like? And was that all of a sudden like, wow, like, you know, all these, all, all these people reaching out to you that, that hadn't earlier? Yeah. So 2019, um, we are 19 people um, at CPE and that makes us the largest organization on race and public safety in the world at 19 people. Um, the TED process was a, as a, as a funding process. Right. So it was a, a kind of grant process, but you can't really like you, you could apply, but it's it's a, a winnowing process. And at the end of that process, um, we had the funding to become like a 75 person organization. 
Huge wow. explosion. Right? Nice job, Ted. Um, you did it this time. So that that was great for us, um, and for the other uh, organizations that were able to go through things like that, like the the uh, the Bail Project, um, uh, Robin Steinberg's group um, that came the year before us. Um, after last year, we're going to be well north of 100, 150 uh, people, um, and the hope is that we're at that size to do the work at scale to do things like not just what we were doing before on data analysis and giving it back, but like what we did in in Ithaca, where we helped the community. Again, these are all community led efforts. We help the community figure out how to come up with a, a process where they didn't want a police department anymore. They wanted a department of public safety and community solutions that was majority unarmed, civilian led, and was not going to send armed respondents to a nonviolent process. If you don't have, a, if there's not a gun in the area, you're not sending somebody with a gun. That's the way that the folks in Ithaca and Tompkins County wanted to set up their public safety. But how do you deal with the budget stuff? How do you deal with the city charter? How do you deal with the local politics? How do you deal with all the national folks who want to get in on it? That's where I feel like CPE has really built up its muscles to figure that out, to guide a process through so that the city council can pass it unanimously and we can start implementation, which is where we're at in Ithaca and Tompkins County, New York right now. So anyone who, who this sounds good to, feel free to move to Ithaca, New York. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> Sounds like it's going to have a, like a very different approach to public safety than, than a lot of the country. Thank this man, thank Philip uh, for, for, for that in part, though I'm sure there are uh, awesome leaders in Ithaca trying to make it happen. Um, uh, and it, it sounds like the grantors have come your direction. And now you're taking it to the next level where you're trying to tell stories in this space, and this is something that that depresses me, Philip. I'm going to be honest with you, um, but it, it feels like everything is degenerating into content. <laughs> I mean, like art, content, politics, content, thought, content, uh, and and the clearest emblem of this to me is that Barack and Michelle Obama, the most successful people in the country, maybe you know, like uh, uh, ex president, ex first lady, like what are they? They're uh, Netflix producers. <laughs> you know, like they're like the highest thing we could aspire to, uh, and, and you know it's something that I grappled with myself. Uh, you know, running for president, uh, a lot of what was necessary was to try to produce content, whatever the heck that meant, in a given moment. Um, uh, and but but this is the way change will occur. We believe because it's the only way to reach people. Um, so now you're the president of the relatively newly formed Justice RX, uh, and people listening to this are like, "Is there anything this guy doesn't do?" Uh, but how did how, how did this? What is Justice RX, and how did it come about? Yeah, and so just to go backwards, it is the people in Ithaca. It's the the leaders. Like <laughs> I, I know, I know. Mayor, I was just kidding around. Anna Carruthers, <laughs> it's the people. So, that, no, but but it, this is actually important because it's about the stories we tell about how change happens, right? So it's those folks who get their stories stolen from them because they're, they're by you, Philip, by you, national person, right? Exactly. So who's a national person <laughs> um, uh, who comes along? And goes, like I did, like like I want to say we helped the community. <laughs> just, the community were the folks who did it in every place. Nerds. I, I, Unaccountable um, academics, who's, I'm only accountable to, uh, uh, you know, like a couple of small rules in Yale's now because now I got tenure, right? So, so what, what the heck can you say to me? Um, we can't really be in the lead, and it's really important to say so. That means the folks who are living it have to be in the lead, and that's why places like Justice Rx and um, like Patrice Cullors, who also has a deal um, at, at Warner Brothers uh, developing mostly children's uh, programming, that's why that stuff is important. The most powerful art form is storytelling. And the reason I know that is because of my colleagues who are neuroscientists. Because storytelling rewires the brain. Memory is the stories that we tell about the world that we've seen and can imagine. And memory is what we latch onto for reality. The fabric of reality is storytelling. I'm not just trying to like, like really blow the minds of the folks who are high listening to this right now. Like that's real talk. But when was the last time we held storytellers accountable for the powers that they wield? And so uh, the, reason, the real reason that I got in this was um, every time you see another black person who shot and killed, inside of 15 minutes, we're having an argument about whether or not they deserved it. 
And the language is, well, was it a justified shooting? And if we say it's justified, be like, well, that's tragic. But I guess there's nothing we can do. It was justified. The shooting was justified. That means they deserve to die. That's what it translates into. And that's a storytelling problem. It's a problem of the structures that we erect to tell the stories to make meaning of the things that we see every day. And you can't undo that with great social science or with sort of institutional change. You can't even get at that at a structural level outside of the way we tell stories about how the world is set up. So I actually think it's good that everything is content. I think it's bad because I still can't figure out what I want to watch on Netflix and there's not another sci-fi thing that I can plug into and get enjoyment out of. But that there's this explosion of content is a good thing because we can start holding content creators accountable for the power that they wield. Well, that was the best case for what the Obamas are doing <laughs> that I've heard. Uh, uh, and The Tomorrow War on Amazon Prime, uh, if you haven't seen it, is a fine sci-fi watch free. Uh, anyway, just letting you know. You just like switch from Netflix to Amazon Prime. Tomorrow War, Chris Pratt, you can thank me later. Uh, but but your, your characterization of what happens when a black man is shot and killed by the police is completely accurate uh you know people like study the grainy video or whatnot and like you know try and draw their their conclusion uh, and and I, I took it as like a way that to your point it's like you're trying to make sense of the world and there are a lot of people who want to believe it's justified because it's a better story to your point than that an innocent black man was shot uh because of a bad cop uh to, to me the proximate cause is the gun <laughs> it's a, like you said if like if they're is no gun, then, you know, the, the shooting doesn't happen. Um, so like it or not, like those are the terms I tend to think in. I try and think about like the actual, uh, like physical variable. Uh, but to your point, like th there are very powerful narratives that underpin things that we see and accept uh, and and see as like somehow unavoidable or inevitable or, or um, uh, natural in, in some demented way. So you've learned so much, you've done so much work in this space. Let's say that I was a police chief in a city um, and was trying to make things better. Um, the, the things that I've gotten um, already from this conversation and past conversations with you are, look, you need to measure different things aside from just uh, crime and criminals. Uh, you need to try to orient your resources towards the real problems that affect people and, and not um, the fake problems. Uh, you need to accept that there's a degree of racism baked into your department. <laughs> and that, you know, in, in my mind too, and this is something that might be controversial to people, like I see racism and tribalism as something of a spectrum where, uh, you know, like you're not going to be able to expunge it entirely uh, in an institution, but you want to keep it from killing people. <laughs> you want to keep it from doing the thing that, you know, is all like, if someone runs into me on the street and like the first thing they think about me is like, oh, Asian guy, and then they draw a couple of conclusions based on that, like I'm okay with that in part because I'll never even know what happens. Like as long as they keep those conclusions from um, making them, you know, like, you know, scream something, you know, like xenophobic and hostile. I mean, like, you know, it's all like, like as long as it's the stop short of some kind of harm or negative action, like, you know, like that, like there's a degree of, um, uh, a race that you know is just ambient um so having police departments accept that in in their departments and try and find the areas they can actually correct for it having reminders that the vast majority of interactions they have are perfectly benign and you know that that their lives aren't on the line um what are the other things that you've done in different departments that have uh driven results yeah, and so there's there's a, a lot in there. Let me see if I can thread some of that back into to the reply. So the, the first thing is I wanna I I I want chiefs, but also when we help to train uh, activists, um, uh, when we engage with local nonprofits, you want to make sure that if you're talking about racism, you specify what level it's operating at. So it's situational. That's just the the immediate thing. All right. So I want to make sure that if my officer has negative stereotypes about a group that they're not acting on them. I want to I want to interrupt that. I want to make the situation safer, which means sometimes I remove the officer from it and I have a mental health responder, right? Ideally not through the police department. Um, but I just want to make that situation safer. The, the second piece is 
we can change some policies so that you're not showing up to those things in the first place. That's an institutional level of racism. Because if the institution has decided we're going to do um, drug possession busts in open air drug markets, guess what? You're going to be rounding up a lot of black and brown folks. You are not going to be touching a lot of white folks. And that's actually not getting at public health. It's not getting at public safety. You're just targeting the vulnerable people. So that's an institutional level of racism. But then there's structural stuff, the things that happen outside of policing. Like, why on earth did those things become crimes in the first place? Why on earth are we sending law enforcement to a mental health call in the first place? Like, we didn't used to do that all the time. We had folks who could come out and do that. We had social workers. We had institutionalized medicine. It was terrible, too, and awful, and racist, and sexist, and gross. But it wasn't always police. What happened was we defunded those public goods in vulnerable communities, interesting word there, and we replaced them with law enforcement. So what I tell law enforcement is, you guys are often getting beat up for the things that you do in the situation which you should fix, the things that are happening in your department which you should fix, and the things that happen before it ever gets to your department which you're not directly in control of. And you should speak out about that. Because if you are the replacement for mental health and homelessness and substance abuse, you're going to get beat up for it. And at some level, like who else are they going to beat up? They should beat up the politicians. They should beat up the people who voted that in. They should beat up the sort of narrative, the stories that we tell about who we are uh, as Americans, that everybody gets to make up their own life, like we're not all dependent on a huge, wide ecosystem that we grew up in and that we participate in. But also it's going to be you. So if you're asking me what I tell police chiefs, I say, learn about the structural racism that you're being used to further, not just the institutional and interpersonal racism that you feel like you're in direct control over. Because right now... We're at a point where the country wants the structural stuff to stop. And, and if you're not part of that solution and you're actively part of the problem, then you shouldn't be surprised when folks are pissed off at you. I've got it. It's refund the services. Instead of defund the it's so, like so refund the services. You are only about three years uh, after the Oakland anti-police uh, terrorism project. <laughs> Because that's what they've been saying, um, actually, for some time. And you're starting to hear some folks who said who said defund talking about refunding communities. For real. I love it. I mean, uh, we've underinvested in so many ways in uh, neighborhoods, families, communities, particularly, obviously, black and brown communities. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen it over and over again. Um, anyone with any common sense who's been in America <laughs> has, has, has seen it. <laughs> Uh, and, and we're spending billions and billions of dollars on a quasi-militarized, or I mean, I, not even quasi, just militarized police force. Um, uh, and so the, the expenditures aren't the right direction, uh, you know, and, and when I've spoken to you about it, uh, you know, like going to police departments and trying to help them solve their problems, you know, it, it's solutions oriented. It's like, look, like, and the fact that you've been building this common ground with police departments and communities who are trying to do the right thing over the last number of years is really worth its weight in gold. I'm so glad that you've gotten the recognition for the work that you're doing. You know, you do it for the right reasons. I mean, you're just like doing it to do it. Um, uh, but the fact that the world's come your way in part because of various tragedies, uh, you know, just very grateful to you, man. You're like a, an inspiration to me and a lot of other people uh, and a hero to me and should be to a lot of other people. If someone, uh, so, I'm going to, to try and spill the beans on something, maybe. I'm going to make news here on Yang Speaks. Uh, like, do you know what Justice RX, like, your, what your first projects are going to be? Or, like, what, you know, where, 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 where we might see them? <laughs> um, we are not in a position to be talking about what those would be just yet. Um, uh, I keep uh, community secrets most and uh, the Hollywood industry secrets second most. Um, so, no, I can't talk about it, but I can talk about the kinds of things um, uh, that we're going to want to be, be showing and I, I use the example of, of let's use the, the, the horrible tragedy of Micaiah Bryant, um, who was killed um, in the same general vicinity um, of the trial of Derek Chauvin. And uh, so it's a young black woman. Um, she had a knife. It appeared she was lunging at somebody else. And people were like, well, that's a justified shooting. She was going to kill somebody. You don't want the police to intervene there. And here's the deal. We know the story of Micaiah Bryant in the... 15, 10 seconds of body cam footage that we saw. But if you're a black woman, black girl, who's been in the foster care system, who's complained about abuse through that system, um, the, the rank rate of physical abuse, of sexual abuse, particularly of young girls through those systems is so violent that 
when that story ends in tragedy, even if you don't want to fault the officer, we should be telling the stories of the lives that led up to that point, right? Guilty people shouldn't get shot and killed by the state either. And so those are the kinds of stories that we're going to want to be telling. Stories that literally untell the lies that we tell about who we are. And we tell so many lies about who we are in this country that my hope is there's going to be a lot of stories to untell that we're going to be able to, 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 to bring out to the world. The idea that what happened was there was slavery and then white people decided slavery is wrong. We're going to fight a war to free the slaves. And the slaves were sitting around being like, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Thank you. That's a lie that got untold the first time in 1935 by Du Bois, W.B. Du Bois, who says, actually, black people were instrumental in freeing the slaves. In fact, black people freed themselves as a part of the process of the Civil War. We don't tell that story. Even when we tell the stories of the Civil War in primary education, we don't talk about the fact that the, that the, the Northern armies were coming down with the thought, yeah, slavery's okay. Right, like slavery, like, like we're we're fighting because because the insistence on slavery is the problem. But slavery, I don't actually care about slaves. And it was the fact that Union armies were going to get their asses handed to them unless Black folks decided, yeah, we're going to get involved in this. Black people freed ourselves, and if we told that story the right way, the idea that abolitionists are advancing right now that we do this till we free us, it's historically necessary. It's historical momentum. It's not a radical new idea. Those are the kinds of things that we're going to be telling with Justice RX. Wow. Yeah, you've uh, ginned up a lot of anticipation, uh, I'm, I'm sure, because that sounds epic and amazing. Uh, you, what you just talked about, the Civil War, reminded me of that movie Glory with Denzel and the rest of it. Uh, you know, uh, it, you know, I mean, like, it was the 80s, so I'm sure it was messed up in various ways. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, but certainly uh, loved that movie as a kid. Um, so if someone wants to help you in your work, uh, Philip, aside from following you in social media, following your work, um, per perhaps supporting... Uh, the Center for Policing Equity uh, directly. But yeah, what, what, what can they do? Most important thing you can do to support all of the work that I'm doing is get involved locally. It's not give me money. It's not, I mean, if you want to follow my Twitter account, then, uh, you know, condolences uh, <laughs> to you. It's a lot of pictures of, of, of wildlife these days because um, the, the rest of this space is so incredibly toxic and awful. Get involved locally. Think about situational, institutional, and structural problems all three levels, all interacting, um, and stay involved. Because what happened after the summer is everybody said, oh, we had a racial reckoning. We didn't have a reckoning. Like we had a racial, we had a, a racial sort of uh, like blip of, of awakeness for about 15 minutes. And people didn't strap in to realize this is, these are problems we've been uh, engaged in for 400 years. So we're, we're not going to get them out in 400 days, right? It's going to take a lot longer to get ourselves out of it. So do whatever you need to do to have your whole life and be involved locally in public safety and criminal legal issues. Get educated. Read new people. Read old people. And be an adult whose life is engaged in this work. Because the places where we go, when there is a critical mass of really brilliant folks already there, we can be useful. Oh, yeah. The places where that's not the case, we, we're useless. We're just a bunch of outsiders trying to help folks get themselves organized. And without the infrastructure, we, we can't do anything useful. So the best thing you can do for me is do for your local community, which means listen to the people who are already there, get involved in stuff that's already going on, get coached, coach yourself up, and then strap in for the long haul. Maybe people can do what they've done in Ithaca, where they end up getting so much community support around a different vision of public safety, and then Philip can show up. <laughs> like, I'm here to help. That, thank you, Philip. Congratulations on everything, uh, man. I, I, I've learned a ton. I'm sure everyone listening to this uh, and just so strong, uh, so positive, so human. Uh, uh, you, you're helping move the entire uh, world forward, man. Just really grateful to you. I appreciate it. Um, if I had one thing to say to everybody at the, at the tail end, which I, I hear people do on this podcast, I'd say this. The thing that I, I pray on every day right before I start my day and right after I've ended it, is I pray to try and make it easier for people to do the right thing. Maybe just a little bit easier. And right now, especially as there's such fever pitch on disagreement on tactics, right? Disagreement on, well, we're gonna do it this way. No, anybody who thinks that, anybody who's been involved in that, is that, it makes it harder for folks to do the right thing. And if that's our ultimate goal, sometimes that's critique, sometimes that's encouragement. If that's our ultimate goal, the day has been made better by the work that we did.
do the right thing. I think I've heard that somewhere too. Thank you, Philip.